The former New York Giants Super Bowl winning quarterback is joining us, a two-time Super Bowl champ. Phil, I just had your son on the other day. Uh, you have to be incredibly proud of him. Uh, he's he's now carving out a great career. You called so many Tom Brady games over the years, often in that late window. When you would sit down with him in these production meetings, did you ever, ever, I mean, you're a good observer of life. Did you ever sense that he was frustrated with the lack of the arsenal he had to work with often in New England? Well, you know, Colin, I, I did not uh, because, you know, I, the years I covered him, he always had a great arsenal. It was either the wide receivers that went undefeated with Randy Moss in that group, or it was the double tight ends, Hernandez and Gronkowski. And then, oh, they took that away or that changes, and they went to the running back passing game. So when I was there and all the years I covered him, of course I have in the last three years, but their offense was always clicking, very creative. And, um, you know, so I never uh, felt frustration from him at all. But I, I have to admit, you know, that this past two years, I have felt it just by reading the paper, watching their games, seeing their offense and everything. And, um, yeah, the, you, you could just feel it. They didn't go to the OTAs, which I'm sure. Yeah. When I don't know. I haven't heard a lot of people talk about that that much. But that is just something that probably irked Bill Belichick more than anything else that could go on that you didn't show up for the OTAs during the offseason. Boy, that's a great point. I totally forgot about that. Yeah, that Tom was giving his signals beyond putting his house up for sale. Not going to the OTAs was a signal. Now, I said this. Well, you know what he was doing? He was just putting them all out there to let you know, don't take me for granted or whatever, which I don't think they did. But, you know, when, when the, you're in a position of being a quarterback, not coming to the, OT, the OTAs, then not to go back to that, but that would be something Bill Belichick could just be going, man, that's just not right. You know, the quarterback is – I know what he thinks and what he expects from his quarterback at all times, all these years I've known him, and he wants you – hey, if you, you don't have to participate, be there – be with the team, be part of it, and still lead us, even though you may be not practicing, practicing as much as the other guys. The four best football coaches, I believe, in my lifetime have been Bill Walsh, Bill Parcells, Jimmy Johnson, and Belichick. Those are, those are my four. Now, I'm not saying they're the best. They're my four. I do believe each one of them may have a hole, just like even Joe Montana could have a hole in his game or Brady could have a hole in his game. Sure. Uh, I've said this about Belichick. He grew up in a very academic household. When yeah. you when you think of academics, you don't think of warmth. There is a certain warmth uh, that I think sometimes he lacks, and I think as Tom got older, he's got kids, that 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 Bill could have been a little warmer toward him. They'd had so much collaborative greatness. Is right. is that a fair criticism of Belichick that there's a certain warmth that he's never had, and perhaps it just wore Tom out, who's a very much a family guy and a loving guy. Well, I think everybody always wants to feel a little love from the coach, whatever, or just appreciation. I'm sure he gave it to him, but that's just not in Bill's makeup. You know, it's not that he goes out of his way to try to be uh, the way you explained. I just think that's who he naturally is. You know, he's a pragmatic guy. Um, you know, he, he, I saw it even with the Giants, this way of just working, let's keep working. And, you know, there was a great interaction. Bill Parcells wasn't warm and fuzzy, that's for sure. But every once in a while, he would walk by you and tap you on the shoulder and go, hey, I just want you to know you're doing great, son, and just walk on by. And, oh, my God, you'd feel like a million dollars. <laughs> I must be doing great for Bill to say something nice about me. But the, the, he did have that in him. Yes. He went to touch you emotionally to help you or to show great appreciation or whatever. And I just don't think that comes naturally to Bill Belichick. By the way, there was there's always been this thought that you and Parcells, there was some Brady Belichick going on. But I watched the two Bills. I find Parcells uh, to be very easy to laugh, even sometimes be, you know, humbled. I, I always feel, I mean, you work with him so closely. I've always felt Bill has a very human side. He's gruff. He's New Jersey tough, but lovable. Very. Yes. I mean, I think everything you said, he was a great psychologist. He was a tremendous football coach, but he was more of a psychologist than anything. Yeah. He knew how to hit the right buttons with every player, and it was different with every player. Some he would be verbally and everything very tough against, and others he would treat them with kid gloves because he knew they couldn't take it. And But the ones that could take it, he would use them, and he would beat them up to show the rest of the team that nobody was – 
above, you know, the rest of the players, and it sent messages to the team, and it was just, it was really, truly very well done by Bill. Did it always work? No. Sometimes I think it backfired a little when he got a little too tough, but, you know, he found a way to always bring it around, Parcells it is, to, to help the team and to give us even a better chance to win. You know, um, if you look at Brady, um, the things he's relied on, are not athletic ability. He's relied on pre-snap reads, accuracy, work ethic, leadership. Right. I don't think those are road. Now, I think he's going to be very successful production-wise in Tampa. Because so do the, I. V- very good. I mean, you could, I could make the argument. If you took every NFL team's two best receivers and best tight end, Tampa's number one in the league, or it's a short list they're in. So I think he'll be productive. But I want you to talk about body. Now, obviously, nutritional standards have been elevated. I want sure. you. I want you to go. Tell me about your last year in the league physically. How did you feel when you got up in age? Um, you know, I how old was I my last year? I guess I was thirty-eight. I think I'm not sure. <laughs> That's terrible. But uh, you know, I felt fine, Colin. Um, I don't remember getting up, and going, "Oh my God, I can't take this anymore." I never felt that. And then when the Giants released me after the 93 season, after we the playoffs, and what a playoff game. Yes. I'm not bitter about it. But, uh, you know, uh, just kidding there, of course. But I, I, you know, I never felt like, oh, my body's worn out. I have to get out of this. I don't like the training. I loved all that about football, the training, the discipline, and everything. And Tom Brady does, too. Let me say this to you. I hear people on TV, his arm is not as good. What are you watching? Thank his you. arm might be better now than it's ever been in Th- his career. Yes. yes. Okay. Here's the other thing, too. He, he might run a 5 3 40 or whatever it was, but he dances in the pocket like he's 4 or 5. I mean, his feet are as, you know, there's a little pop to him, whatever you want to call it, juice. There's just great rhythm to his feet. And, you know, there's very few quarterbacks in the league that have them, have it as good as he does. Deshaun Watson, great feet, man. He's like a dancer back there. And Tom Brady is still that way. You watch him. I've seen highlights of him from last year. And I look at him and I just go, man, he can just move around that pocket like he's a ballet dancer. And that is something that I don't know why more quarterbacks don't emulate now. It's just maybe they don't know how. Somebody's got to teach them. But he has learned that and used it to his strength. And I watched him all the games I did. I think I did near 90 Patriot games. Wow. I watched him practice all this foot movement, pocket movement, everything. I watched them do it every single time I was there. They worked very hard at it. And, of course, you know, that hard work and all that time put in, put, in, put into that, it shows up when you watch Tom Brady play. You know, the other thing, Phil, you didn't always have great O-lines until last year. I could make the argument that the one unit Tom always played with that was top 10 was O-lines. He has not taken a ton of hits. Now, I can remember you at times in your career getting blasted. A, it was allowed, and you didn't always have a great O-line. Brady has largely, his sack numbers are very low. He's always had above average tackles and centers. And I wonder if Phil Simms, if you were playing today... With your brain power, you would eat better than nutrition. You were 38. But remember, 38 now is about 35. Phil, no question. I, I think, Phil, had you been given, because I remember your last year, had you been given Tom's O-lines and the nutritional advancements, you would be playing at 40. I honestly believe that. Oh, I, I do, too. I mean, I, I have no doubt about that. I still thought even when my career ended, I was like, man, I – I, I flirted with coming back a couple times. I had three teams make me better offers than I ever received from the Giants. Wow. And, you know, my wife, my kids were growing up. I think my son Christopher might have been getting ready to go into high school. And my wife says, oh, that's so great. I'm so happy for you. And we'll come visit you on weekends. <laughs> and I said, okay, that is not going to happen. I'm not doing, I, I know that story where the guys live in the hotel, how that goes. It doesn't go well. So. But, hey, listen, I did play for some really good offensive lines for a long period of time. It was just a different game. We held the ball. We threw it down the field. Yes. Stand in there, take the hit. Now you got screens. That's what the Patriots did such a great job of. 
Tom Brady, of course, will get rid of the football to avoid sacks. That's great. But they throw all those screens and quick passes to keep your defensive line off balance. And then if they want to throw it down the field, if they're worried about protection, they're not afraid. You know what? They don't, oh, we don't have to get all five guys out. Somebody hit this uh, tight end, hit the guy on your side, running back before you go in your route, hit the other defensive end. Brady got the extra time, then he fired the football down the field. Yeah, he's, I said this last year. He takes about one to two shots a year. You know, where you're like, ah, that's that's tough. But he's actually practiced getting hit. So I think I I, I think he's an, a 39-year-old guy who's actually 43. Well, I just can't wait. You know, he his age, you know, they all used to make fun of me in the locker room. Music would come on. What's his sound feel? Do you know it? And I, you know, if I was right, they'd be like flabbergasted. Oh, my God, you know. Uh, it was it was fun. So he'll he's going to have guys down there calling him Mr. Brady in Tampa Bay because they're going to be. Of course, they think of him as this mythical figure, which he basically is. And here's the other thing: he's never his communication with Bruce Arians and the coaching staff will be like nothing he's ever really had in his life either in pros and the pros because Bruce, it's all out there. He talks to you. You know, there's no holding back. It's just the truth or. Either way, good or bad, and, uh, you know, he makes it personal. Uh, that's why players love playing for Bruce Arians. Uh, it's the second year of this staff of his being together. That's right. It's I, big. Yeah. I think it's a really, really good coaching staff down in Tampa Bay. He did a great job of getting it together. And, hey, if Jameis Winston was the quarterback in Tampa Bay this year, I would have said, look out. I think they have a chance. I, I watched every one of their games last year. They were always in it. They just found ways to lose. Jameis Winston would play. He makes as many spectacular plays as any quarterback in the NFL. His problem was three times a game he lost control of the football. And for a quarterback in the NFL, if you lose it once a game or once every other game, that's about it. You just can't lose control of the football. He does as part of how he throws it, the position he gets in. And he missed it one way. Colin, how was it? Where did he throw it when he usually missed? It was always high. Yeah. And you go high and miss them high, there's always people standing behind ready to catch it. And that, really, that's that changed his whole football career. Yeah, by the way, Baker Mayfield this year had a problem with sailing the football. And sure, it, you know why? Yeah. Because he was trying to throw it too hard, reaching back more than he did the year before, where he has plenty of arm, you know, isn't throwing it 98 miles an hour good enough? Why do we got to reach back and try to throw it 99? And I thought that was the biggest difference in Baker Mayfield's play this year. He just overthrew the football. And when you do that, generally, it's going to get away from you just a little bit. And, and again, where did he miss him? He threw the ball high, got tipped a lot, down the field, up in the air, interceptions, missed guys that he didn't miss the year before. So I, I would think hopefully this year he'll settle down and just throw the ball with normal pace. And then when you need to put some pepper on it because the coverage is really tight and you're throwing in between guys, then, you know, then you let it go. Then you really rear back and just throw it with all you got. Yeah, Kurt Schilling always told me, he said, you know, at the end of my career, I had about 12 fastballs. <laughs> and you just yeah. you use them with discretion. It's a three and two count. And, you, you, you know, he goes, you just you don't use them in the early innings if you can't. Finally, two time Super Bowl champ Phil Sims. What a pleasure for us. Finally. Well, let me just say this before we yeah. get on to it. Yeah. Jameis Winston, wherever he goes, I would think he will go to a good football team that's trying to give their their playoff bound, they think, team insurance. And that would be great for him. And if you're the starting quarterback, don't let him get in there. Because I think his talent is very good in the right system. Get him under control a little. Don't put everything on his shoulders like Tampa Bay did. It's all about you today, big boy. Throw it to the right guy and be accurate the whole time that he could be he could be a Ryan Tannehill type of quarterback next year somewhere. Well, he's very productive, just sometimes for the defense. But you can't yeah. you can't deny his productivity. Finally, Joe Burrow, give me your thoughts on what kind of prospect he is. Well, listen, he it's really interesting. Last year, watched him really close. The year before, I should say, when he was at LSU, when the season was over, I watched his game. Said, "Oh, okay, I like him because I'd read some stuff." I said, "You know, he looks like he's going to be a third or fourth round pick." Of course, LSU brought a pro passing concept to the college game and ran it that way. Of course, they had great receivers and everything, and he took advantage of every bit of it. And he played like a pro, was taught like a pro. Uh, his movement, 
is was very good. He knew when to take off and run. Sneaky fast, no doubt about it. Great decision maker. And, hey, he's going to walk into a pro offense, and he's going to go, look, oh, I've seen this before, because their offense and Alabama's offense, to me, were so good for the quarterbacks to play under and to really learn to be pro football players. So Joe Burrow, you might not like this comparison, but there's a lot of Daniel Jones in there. The only difference is one played at LSU and one played at Duke. <laughs> and, you know, so Daniel Jones, he got roughed up a lot more and things like that. But Daniel Jones, I think he proved that he was really worthy of the sixth pick of the draft last year. The fact that his throwing was much better than I expected, yeah. uh, has enough strength in his arm to make all the throws. The only thing he didn't do, Colin, yes, he fumbled, but he didn't run enough. Man, if I had those legs... That first guy wasn't open. I say, I'm no you stand here taking a hit. Let's run. Yeah. Uh, that that would be the only downside I'd see to what Daniel Jones did. But Joe Burrow is the finished product, and I'll be shocked, of course, if the Bengals don't take him. Phil, thank you so much. I had Chris on earlier, you this week, a Sims. Well, week. I apologize for my son. I'm sure he said something <laughs> that you know, got everybody mad, but that's the way he is. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, thank you so much. All right, Colin, good to talk to you, man. Have a good day. All right, Phil Sim. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.